As we know, the Red Bull driver program has produced so many great drivers in the last 15 years. Drivers who have gone on to be race winners, podium finishers and even world champions. But there's been other drivers that have been not that good. Or drivers that have not got the chance they should have got. So in today's video, I'm going to look at the history of the Red Bull driver program within Formula 1 and whether it has worked. So if you want to find out from me if I think the driver program has worked for Red Bull, then make sure to check out this video. So back in 2005, once Red Bull took over the Jaguar team, they were ready now to unleash their great young talent on the Formula 1 world. Drivers such as Christian Klein, Tony Liuzzi and Scott Speed. And they were hoping that one of these drivers at least was going to be a star. But Klein, he turned out in the first year at Red Bull in 2005 to not be that bad. But then in 2006, he had a poor year. And ended up getting replaced at the back end of that season by Robert Dornbos. You must be bad if he is your replacement. But with Tony Liuzzi, Red Bull were hoping that this guy would be their superstar of the future. Because Tony Liuzzi in his junior formula career and karting career was a superstar. He was very, very quick and very, very successful. And given that his generation was so talented with drivers such as Nico Rosberg, Lewis Hamilton and Robert Kubica, surely Liuzzi was going to work out. Well, he didn't mainly because he could not translate that speed and success from junior formula into formula one and he never really had that many good performances whether at red bull or toro rosso he had been given so many chances by either the red bull team or the toro rosso team but he did not take it leading to his demise at the end of 2007 and even when he came back into formula one he still was not a success for me, Tony Liuzzi is a perfect example of junior formula success not mattering once you get to Formula 1. Because if it did, Tony Liuzzi would have been the best Italian driver since Alberto Ascari. But of course, he really was not. And for Scott Speed, nothing really went his way, nor was he really that quick. And eventually fell out of Helmut Marco in 2007, leading to his demise from the Toro Rosso team. And from his time in Formula 1, it's safe to say that Scott did not have the speed. <laughs> what, you didn't think I was really going to make that joke? Luckily for Toro Rosso and the Red Bull driver program, Scott Speed's replacement at Toro Rosso was Sebastian Vettel. Another young driver with plenty of talent. And this was the first success of the Red Bull driver program within Formula 1. As Sebastian Vettel, of course, in 2008, proved to be a very, very good driver. And even won for Toro Rosso in 2008. And got his big promotion to the Red Bull team in 2009. And as we know, he went on to be a four-time world champion. Surely after Sebastian Vettel, the talent is just going to keep pouring through the Toro Rosso team and the academy. Well, not exactly. Sebastian's teammate in 2008 was Sebastian Borde, who was not really a young driver, but was having an okay 2008. And it was okay enough for him to be driving for the team in 2009, where he partnered new young driver Sebastian Buemi. Seemingly, the only way you get into a Toro Rosso is being called Sebastian. But Borde in 2009 literally did nothing leading to Harry Potter being replaced by Jaime Alguersuari, a 19-year-old Spanish driver who was coming through the ranks very quickly within the junior Formula world. And Red Bull were impressed enough to just put him straight in the Toro Rosso mid-season. And with Buemi and Alguersuari, surely one of these drivers would go on to be a very good driver in Formula 1 and a Red Bull driver. But you see, there's a problem. Right around this time, Red Bull are now entering the dominant period of their history and have two very good drivers in Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber who are going for the World Championship. Meaning that there is basically no chance of Buemi or Alguersuari getting into the Red Bull. And despite some good performances in 2010 and 2011 from both drivers, Red Bull decided to get rid of both. As Sebastian Buemi went on to be a driver in the WEC series and also Formula E. 
Meanwhile, Al Ghaswari basically quit racing and went on to be a DJ. Bit of a weird choice, but there you go. They were replaced by Massive Jawline and Jean-Eric Verne. Another two drivers who were very talented. But would they actually be good enough and talented enough to get to Red Bull? Well, one of the drivers absolutely was, and his name, of course, was Daniel Ricciardo, who, after having quite a learning experience in 2012, really shone in 2013, especially in qualifying. And now, luckily for him, fellow Aussie Mark Webber was going to retire from Formula 1, leading to Daniel Ricciardo's hiring as a Red Bull driver. Ricardo's replacement at Toro Rosso was very surprising new young driver Daniel Kvyat, who was not very known in the Formula 1 world at the time. But in his first year at Toro Rosso, he did actually impress considering how young he was. And Jean-Eric Vang was still doing well for the team and showcasing the talent he had. And when Sebastian Vettel announced he was going to go to Ferrari for 2015, surely Jean-Eric was going to get that seat. Well, no, he did not. It went to Daniel Kvyat. And because of the gutting decision, Jean-Eric Verne was out of Formula 1 by the end of 2014. And has gone right down the Sebastian Buemi route of racing in WEC and Formula E. And in Formula E, he's done pretty well in a racing series that is basically for Formula 1 rejects. But when Kvyat went to Red Bull, Red Bull knew that Daniel was not going to be a long-term replacement for such a great driver in Sebastian Vettel. And they needed some great new talent to come through right away, and they got it. In their 2015 Toro Rosso lineup in Carlos Sainz Jr. and Max Verstappen. Two very quick drivers, two very competitive drivers, drivers that were very keen to get in the Red Bull. But ultimately, at the end of 2015, it was really showed that Max Verstappen was, already at 17 or 18 years old, the better. And it was only a matter of time when he got to Red Bull. And Red Bull was so desperate to put him in the team, they dropped Kvyat after one mistake to put Max in the car after four races in 2016. And it's safe to say that worked out. Meaning at Toro Rosso for the rest of that season and for most of 2017, it was Carlos Sainz and Daniel Kvyat. But things were not well at Toro Rosso and in the Red Bull Driver Academy. Because for one, Carlos Sainz was sick of not getting opportunity to go to Red Bull, so he decided to go to Renault at the back end of 2017 and for 2018 as well. And Daniel, after plenty of poor performances, eventually got dropped for Brendan Hartley. A driver who only got back into the academy and got a chance in Formula 1 because he called Helmut Marco and offered his services. And replacing Carlos Sainz was Pierre Gasly, the GP2 champion of 2016. Now in 2018, despite a couple very, very good performances by Pierre Gasly, this lineup and these two drivers of Gasly and Hartley weren't exactly incredible or amazing. And for Pierre Gasly, he definitely needed more time if he was going to develop into a good driver. But the problem for Red Bull was, was that Daniel Ricciardo announced he was off to Renault for 2019. And because Red Bull only put Red Bull Driver Academy drivers in their Red Bull Racing team, they had no choice but to put Pierre Gasly in the Red Bull. Even though Red Bull did not think Gasly was ready. And boy did that prove to be the case. As in Gasly's only 12 races as a Red Bull driver, it was a complete disaster. Woeful performances, putting his car in the midfield when it was a top car, and even getting lapped by teammate Max Verstappen. These absolutely awful performances led to Red Bull replacing Gasly at Red Bull with Alexander Albon, who was teammates at Toro Rosso with this other driver called Daniel Kvyat. Wait, didn't Kvyat drive for Red Bull and Toro Rosso before? Yes, he did. Red Bull were struggling to find drivers to put in the Toro Rosso that they brought Kvyat back. And even Albon was in the Red Bull Driver Academy way before he got into Formula 1. The Red Bull Driver Academy was now in such a bad place, they were now bringing back previous drivers. That isn't exactly a smooth operation, is it? And now you have Gasly going back to Toro Rosso to partner Daniel Kvyat and Alexander Albon somehow, someway in the Red Bull car. 
And with the way things are going, Pierre Gasly is probably not even going to be at Toro Rosso by the end of 2019. Because Pierre produced some of the worst performances in the history of a top team since Michael Andretti in 1993. For a Formula 1 driver's quality, do you know how hard that is? Michael Andretti at times was 2 or 3 seconds off the pace of his teammate Ayrton Senna. I know it's Senna, but if you're going to rival Michael Andretti for being so bad, then you have done a very bad job. And now we are in a situation where Red Bull don't know who they're going to put in the second seat at Red Bull for 2020. It could be Alvin, it could be Kvyat, it could be someone else. Even someone else outside of the academy. And for this situation, Red Bull have only themselves to blame. Because ever since Sebastian Vettel has left Red Bull at the end of 2014, they've completely burned through talent. And have not given that talent enough time to flourish. I mean, since 2015, which was four years ago, they've had Carlos Sainz, Max Verstappen, Daniel Kvyat, Pierre Gasly, Brendan Hartley and Alexander Albon. Only two of those drivers have properly made it in Formula 1. Whilst the others have either been failures or have not really made it yet in the sport. And it's because Red Bull are not giving talent enough time to flourish at Toro Rosso and within Formula 1. For example, look at Daniel Kvyat. When he came into Formula 1, he wasn't very experienced and he was very, very young. To be honest, if they really cared about the health and well-being of Daniel's career, they would not have put him in the Red Bull in 2015. Because even though in 2014 Daniel did have a couple good performances, it was clear that Daniel needed time. He did not need to have his career rushed and have his confidence destroyed by the time he's 22 or 23. You've got to take time with young drivers. They're not going to be the finished product. For example, look at Mika Hakkinen when he was at McLaren. Now, even though the McLaren in most of the early years Hakkinen was there was not that good, McLaren let Hakkinen develop because they knew if they gave him the time to develop, eventually he would go on to be a great driver. Now I'm not saying Daniel was going to be a great driver or is ever going to be a great driver, but if you destroy the confidence of a young driver, then that does severely hamper their chances. You have got to be very mindful with how you look after a young driver's career. Because if you put them in the wrong car or the wrong team or the wrong situation, they're not going to be as good as they should be. And again, going back to 2015, it should have been Vern in that Red Bull car because Vern was more ready for that car than Kvyat was. Kvyat needed time to develop a Toro Rosso. Yes, they had Carlos Sainz and Max Verstappen, you know, ready to come through. But again, when you put a driver into your Toro Rosso or Red Bull car, if you really do care about their careers, then you've got to look out for what is best for them. If you want a driver like Daniel Kvyat or even Pierre Gasly to develop into a good driver, you've got to give them time to show it. And give them time to develop and become confident within the world of Formula 1 or with their own team. But Red Bull do not do that because they're constantly looking for the next Sebastian Vettel or Max Verstappen way too soon. Not everyone is going to be a once in a generation talent. Not everyone's going to be a world champion driver. Some drivers are very good early on. Some drivers need time to develop. Again, case in point, Mika Hakkinen. And because they're constantly looking for the next Max Verstappen or the next Sebastian Vettel, now they're in a situation where they have burned through way too many drivers to the point where they don't know who to put in the second car alongside Max Verstappen. And if they continue to rush through drivers, this will continue happening. Because let's say Gazi is out of Formula 1 for 2020 and Daniel Kvyat or Albon gets promoted to Red Bull in 2020. In the Toro Rosso, if you have Kvyat and another driver and Albon's in the Red Bull, but then in 2020 Albon doesn't do that good, then what are you going to do? Continuously promote and demote drivers all the time. You can't do that. You've got to give drivers time. And if you want to have a steady flow of good young drivers, you can't burn through all of them all at once. 
because you're not going to get great drivers every year coming into a Toro Rosso. You're going to have maybe one great driver coming into a Toro Rosso, say, once every five years. But knowing Red Bull, they'll continue doing what they're doing because they think that's best. But I, of course, disagree. But guys, let me know in the comments section. Do you think, first off, the Red Bull driver program has been a success? I think it has because there has been, I think, enough good, talented drivers that they have promoted into Formula 1 for it to be a success. I think lately it hasn't been that good, but I don't think you can take what's happened in the last couple of years as, you know, the last 14 as a whole as what it's been. So let me know in the comments whether you think the Red Bull program has been a good thing or not. And... What do you think of the current system they're you know, currently doing where they're constantly sacking, hiring drivers and do you think it does work in that way or do you disagree? Do you think they should give drivers more time? Let me know in the comment section down below and also let me know what you thought of this video. And also guys, don't forget to subscribe for more content like this and subscribe for the next content coming up which is a Friday live practice watch along for the 2019 Belgian Grand Prix. I'll be live at 1.30 p.m. UK time on Friday for that. So until then, guys, it has been me, Chazra HD. Goodbye.